ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله تركنا على المحجه البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها الا هالك ولا ينتظم في سلكها الا سالك اللهم صل وسلم وانعم واكرم وبارك على حبيبنا وشفيعنا وملاذنا وقره عيوننا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الاولين وفي الاخرين وفي الملا الاعلى الى يوم الدين يقول عز من قائل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اللهم اجعلنا منهم يا رب العالمين اللهم امين in the name of allah the gracious the merciful to him we belong and to him we shall return we ask allah jalla wa ala in his infinite grace and boundless mercy to send an abundance of prayers and peace upon our beloved messenger muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon this community to have mercy upon this ummah to have mercy upon our families our children our parents our aunts our uncles may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon our grandparents and our great grandparents and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon this world may he bring relief to those in this world who are in anguish and in pain in agony may allah bring them refuge and solace in this life before the next allahumma amin ya rabbal alamin Brothers and sisters, today we will continue with our journey, the journey of defining, exploring what is Islam, a journey that we have now given many khutab about and we will continue to, as I mentioned, give many, many, many more. In our last installment, which was roughly two weeks ago, we discussed the significance of the first dimension of Ad-Din al-Islami. As you all should know and recall by now, in the journey to exploring and defining what is Islam, we are utilizing the Hadith of Jibreel. After spending time discussing the first element of the Hadith of Jibreel, was, which was a discussion about the necessary adab, etiquettes and qualities that we have to embody, we mentioned that there are a multiple, multiple dimensions to the totality of ad al-Islami. The first dimension is an external dimension which was captured in the question of what is Islam with a lowercase i. What are the things that the person should do with their body, with their resources, etc. The second question of the Hadith of Jibreel was a Hadith that discussed the internal, intellectual state of the believer. What are the thoughts, the ideas, the understandings that we should have about this world and the next? And the last question or the, the question before the last, the third dimension is the dimension of spirituality. The this desire and the pursuit of ihsan internally as well as externally. And then the last being a question of time. So we began to explore the first dimension of this religion a couple of weeks back. And the entire purpose of that khutbah was to indicate one essential thing. That what we do matters. That from Allah Jalla wa'ala's wisdom is that He has created us as these material bodies. Just as He has created for us an intellect and a spiritual reality, He has created a material body. And around these material bodies are other material bodies. There are things that we have to negotiate every single day. What we do with our hands, what we do with our eyes, what we do with our mouths, the types of relationships that we have, the types of business transactions that we can can, can commit to the type of relationships that we are allowed to have what is halal what is haram all of that is governed in the first dimension of this religion and so the case that I was making last time was we cannot simply say that God doesn't care about what I do he only cares about what I am inside that is a claim that as a Muslim I cannot make because clearly in this religion in the Quran and in the Sunnah, Allah makes it abundantly clear that He cares very much about what we do. It is not to say that that is the only thing He cares about, but it is one of the three essential dimensions that He does dictate about in the scripture, 
that he says, I want you to do and not do specific things. Today, I want us to answer the question of, well, if what I do is important and God cares about what I do, then how do I go about, pay attention now, how do I go about being and doing the things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And how do I go about staying away from the things that are displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because it's one thing to know that what I do is important. It's a whole other thing to know, well, how do I go about doing or learning what is important and what is not? Because that is another challenge that we face today. There is a, there's an arbitrariness that many of us are taking to the deen in terms of our practice. There are those who will just simply, as I've mentioned in the past, they'll listen to a professor in the university who seems to have certain type of accolades and recognition in the academic space, but are they truly the people that we will take as religious guides? There's a very common trope that many of us say, we'll say, for example, I will follow the Quran and Sunnah. There is no doubt that anyone who believes in Allah, anyone who believes in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the only way to be a proper Muslim is to follow the Quran and Sunnah. That is the only way. There is no third arrangement. You have to follow the Quran and Sunnah. But the question is, how do I even go about following the Quran and Sunnah? Because some of us will say, well, I take my directions directly from the Quran and Sunnah. So what if I were to do that, you were to do that? Let's say we have 2,000 people who will pray Jum'ah with us today. There are millions of Muslims across the world. If every single person was on their own accord to say, I will follow the Quran and Sunnah, then we will effectively have 1.6 billion opinions in the world. Clearly that is, that's a type of chaos that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not legislating for. That is not the way in which the Prophet sallallahu has guided us to be. So brothers and sisters, long story short, there is a rhyme, a reason, a logic, and a methodology that we have to commit ourselves to to ensure that what we are doing is sound. And so I want to give you guys a very brief, quick history from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu until today that explores for us how exactly the idea of Al-Fiqh Al-Islami came even into existence. Because as I noted last time, this first question of what is Islam when the Prophet illustrates prayer and fast and zakah and hajj and so on, it is from that question that we have what is known as al-fiqh al-islami, Islamic law. It, it emanates from that first question. We have in our library, we have thousands upon thousands of Islamic legal scholars that have, com have composed millions of pages of Islamic law. All of that I promise you was done with a very distinct methodology. It wasn't arbitrary, it wasn't subjective, it wasn't just what they thought or what they felt, but rather there was a process and there was an inherited process and a distinct methodology that all of us have to become familiar with so that today when I go and I choose the people that I will listen to, to learn my religion, to learn my do's and don'ts, I have some, some awareness and some material to actually apply in that regard. It all started with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the first legislator, if you will, that we have in this religion. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received revelation. He received the Quran from Allah Jalla wa Ala through the angel Jibreel. And his role was as from the essential Mubayyineen. He was an essential clarifier of what exactly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is communicating to us. Because all you and I are trying to do is very simple. We're trying to figure out what Allah jalla wa ala expects from us in this dunya. That's our goal. My goal is very simple. Ya Allah, you are my creator. You have revealed to me this revelation. What do you expect from me? And how do you want me to act so that I act in a way that is pleasing to you? And that is the question that the Prophet Sallallahu started to answer and all of the inheritors after the Prophet Sallallahu were answering the same exact question. So the Prophet was the beginning. And in his time, there was no need for anyone but the Prophet Sallallahu An issue came up. Something happened. 
a disagreement occurred. There was a difference of understanding. All of that happened. Who would they go to? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because he is the Musharri'a in that regard. He is Al Mubayyin, Al Awwal. So there was no confusion, not much confusion back then. And by the way, SubhanAllah, when you look at Al Ahkam al Shari'a, when you look at religious rulings, you will find that out of the 6,000 plus ayat we have in the Quran, Roughly, according to Imam al-Ghazali, Imam al-Razi, and others, roughly only 550 ayat deal with al-ahkam al-shari'a, religious legal rulings. So out of 6,000 plus ayat, it is a minority of those ayat that deal with the do's and don'ts, the halal and the haram, the fiqh, the law. And so that shows you something about, there is no doubt it's an essential part, but it is also the smallest part of this religion. Because you will find ayat in the Qur'an that talk about history. You will find ayat in the Qur'an that talk about iman, aqidah, theology, belief. What I think about the dunya, the akhirah, the hisab of the akhirah, jannah, jahannam, angels, etc., prophets. You will also find many, 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 many ayat that discuss spirituality, ihsan, to be amongst the muhsineen to beautify the heart, to cleanse the heart, and the list goes on. Inshallah, we will have plenty of khutab dedicated to those. So the Prophet ﷺ receives this revelation and he begins to tell people what to do and what not to do. But what we also see in that time period is that there was a gradation for that. The first roughly 12 years of divine revelation, you saw very little talk about ahkam shar'iya. So it, predominantly in the Meccan period, which was the first period of the Prophet ﷺ's life as a prophet, you will find very little ahkam that were dealt very few. The overwhelming majority of Islamic legal rulings were dispensed in the Medinan period. The Meccan period was predominantly dedicated to what? Spiritual theological cultivation to strengthen the iman and the aqidah in the hearts of his followers. And this is a very important note that all of us should think about when we're thinking about our own practice and then we're teaching our children the religion. Because so many of us, when we speak about the religion, we immediately go to what? The ahkam, the halal and the haram, the do's and the don'ts. And we speak very little about the love for Allah, the belief in Allah, the belief in the prophets, the belief in the angels. Because what the prophet taught us simply in that gradation that he did was, you need to have somewhere where the ahkam can settle. These rulings, these legal rulings, they have to have a place where they are grounded. So when you're teaching your children about this religion, begin by teaching them about Allah Jalla wa'ala, the magnificence of Allah. Talk to them about the mercy of Allah, the love of Allah. And that's why inshallah this Ramadan we will dedicate the entire Ramadan. All of the khawat and all of the durus will be dedicated to one cause and that is, who is Allah? We want to develop a knowledge of an Allah of, and a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us tawfiq to accomplish that. So what you will find is that it is important that first and foremost you cultivate that love and that knowledge of Allah and then you place the ahkam within it. So the Prophet sallallahu he was present as we mentioned, telling people what to do and what not to do. But then what you would find are very unique developments. And I want you to keep this in mind as we're progressing forward in the history. The Prophet ﷺ, at times, he would be posed, posed, questions would be posed to him. But he would leave the door open for differences of opinion. And it was a very unique thing that the Prophet ﷺ did. There's a famous example. When the Prophet ﷺ commanded the companions, he said, لا يصلين أحدكم العصر إلا في بني قريضة that none of you are to pray Asr, the, the Asr prayer, except in Banu Quraidha. This was one of the expeditions that the companions were going out on. Now they had left Medina in the time of Dhuhr. And the Prophet ﷺ said, do not pray Asr except in Banu Quraidha. The companions left. Asr time came in. They, the companions noticed that Maghrib time was coming soon. So the companions stopped. Half of the companions, pay attention, they said, Maghrib is about to come in, we have to pray Asr. So let us stop and pray Asr. The other half of the companions said what? The Prophet said explicitly, 
do not pray Asr until you arrive in Banu Quraidah. So we cannot pray Asr now, even if the Maghrib time comes in. The other group of companions, they said, no, no, what the Prophet was saying was more metaphorical. He was just indicating that I want you to move very quick. So we should pray now and then continue. The other half said no. The Prophet said it. We will follow him explicitly. Long story short, half of the companions prayed in transit. Half prayed when they arrived at Banu Quraida. They went back to the Prophet ﷺ. He's still alive. They went to him said, Ya Rasulullah, this is what we did. Half prayed this way. Half prayed that way. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? Aqar. He, he affirmed that what these people did was sound and we, he affirmed what this group of people did was sound. Both of groups arrived at what is a credible, legitimate Islamic opinion through certain processes and approaches. When presented to the Prophet wasallam, he said, both of you have done that which is sound and correct. What the Prophet ﷺ did for us in this moment is he opened up a door for what is known as al khilafu al-Mu'tabar. Valid, recognizable, acceptable difference of opinion. That there is such a concept. See, the Prophet could have easily said what you did was wrong and what you did was right. And, I am, and, and we come to know that the Prophet ﷺ probably has an opinion about what in that regard was the better opinion. But he left it open so that the ummah thereafter will find itself in some fusha, an openness to legitimately disagree. And this is a very subtle point because there are those amongst us who say there should be no disagreement in matters of Islamic law. There should be one opinion and that's what everyone should follow. Even during the time of the Prophet, that didn't happen. Clearly. And then there are those who say, it's wide open. Everyone should be able to disagree on anything when it comes to Islamic law. That is also chaos that is not to be. There is a balanced center of legitimate disagreement that should always and will always and has always existed. After the Prophet ﷺ died, there were the companions who were present and you had the fuqaha, the legal scholars of the companions, because by the way, not all of the companions were fuqaha mujtahideen, not all of them. They were numbered. Amongst them was Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, Sayyiduna Umar, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Umar, Sayyiduna Aisha radiallahu anhu was one of the great fuqaha and scholars of the companions. Even Sayyidina Umar would come to Sayyidina Aisha, who was roughly 40 years younger than him. And he would sit and he would take from her at times just to see that it was no, there was no consideration for anything except the principle of Islamic law and knowledge. And the people who are credentialed and authorized, they are the ones who speak in the matters of the deen. Not all of the companions were to give fatawa. Even those companions themselves, they differed on matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, وَالْمُطَلَّقَاتِ يَتَرَبَّسْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءٍ that when a divorce happens, the waiting period should be thalathata quru, three quru. What is this word qur? The companions differ down the line around the meaning of the word qur. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, they say that qur means the actual menstruation. Because the word qur in the Arabic language means two things. It simultaneously means the menstruation, menstruation period, and at the same time, the word Qur'an means the ritual purity from menstruation. So the period after menstruation. So you have Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud saying what this word means, it means the actual menstruation. Then you have Zayd ibn Thabit, one of the other fuqaha of the companions, as Sayyidina Aisha. They say, no, it actually means tuhr. It means ritual purity from menstruation. Here are two groupings of companions. These are the best of the best of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are all authorities, scholars, credentialed Islamic legal um, scholars who differ on this point. And until today, both opinions exist. Subhanallah. 
What does that show you? It shows you, number one, that there are only certain qualified people who can speak on the matters of ijtihad, of what we should and should not do. But there's also a recognition that there is always a possibility of multiple legitimate opinions. Because you will see that to then be the case generation after generation. After the companions, we have the tabi'een, the followers of the companions. And amongst the tabi'een, which were hundreds of thousands, not all of them were fuqaha, not all of them were legal mujtahidi scholars who can deduce religious opinions. It was a minority of them. The likes of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, who was the grandson of the Sayyidina Abu Bakr, the likes of Ibrahim al nahi and many others. Imam al-Zuhri, these were all scholars of the tabi'een. And subhanAllah, in that time period, you see differences of opinion. You even begin to see the development of schools in Islamic law, in Islamic legal theory. You have historically the school of the people of Medina and the school of the people of Iraq. Ahlul Hadith wa Ahlul Ra'i. At the helm of the, the scholars of the people of Hadith of Medina are the likes of Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Al Qasim ibn Muhammad, and so on and so forth. You find their heritage going back to certain companions amongst the companions of the Prophet. The people of Iraq, this madrasa known as Ahlul Ra'i, at the helm of that were legitimate, qualified, authoritative scholars of the likes of Ibrahim al Nahri who came from the school of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was a part of the school of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Here are two legitimate approaches that were developing because the world was expanding. It was no longer just this simple ummah that existed in Medina, but now the world was expanding. The prophets, the companions, and the followers of the companions were going out into the world. So you began to see different types of legitimate approaches. But then after that time period, and I'm going very, very quick, by the way. After that time period, you, had a, you have what is known as Asr al-Imma al-Mujtahideen. The period of the, the qualified, legitimate scholars of ijtihad. Because after the companions and after the tabi'een, you began to find that there were independent scholars who were all of the standing of mujtahid. And this is a very important word that we have to make sense of. Because today we use this word loosely. But the concept of ijtihad is an extremely subtle, rigorous, methodical concept that all of us have to develop a basic understanding of. What does it mean to be a mujtahid? It means that you are someone who has mastered all of the sciences of the Arabic language. And they are... They are upwards of 17 sciences just within the Arabic language. And then the scholars differ. Do you need to know with expertise eight of those sciences or 12 of those sciences? But nonetheless, I'm sure most of us, all of us can barely mention one, two, or three of those sciences. We can probably say nahu, balagha, isarf. But what else? There are up to 17 sciences in the Arabic language other than grammar, morphology, and rhetoric. So you have to have mastery of all of the Arabic sciences. You have to have mastery of the Qur'an and the tafsir and the ara of the Qur'an. You have to have mastery of the hadith. And you have to have mastery of the people of hadith and the understanding of those hadith sciences and many, many, many other disciplines. Once you develop that level of mastery, which is extremely difficult to master and to accomplish, then you become what is known as a mujtahid. And then you can start to say, you can directly go to the Qur'an and Sunnah and say, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. And so in the first period, you began to have some of those individuals popping up here and there. You have the likes of Sufyan al-Thawri, who was Imam Mujtahid. You have the likes of Imam al-Layth ibn Sa'ad, Imam Mujtahid. You have the likes of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Mujtahid. The likes of... Imam Amalik, Imam Mujtahid. You have the likes of Imam Ash-Shafi'i, Imam Mujtahid. Imam Ahmad, Imam Mujtahid. You had many, many A'imma Mujtahidun. But what happened at that point? Those people, they had people who were following them. And then subhanAllah, period after period, the collective Ummah agreed upon essentially four of these A'imma Mujtahidun. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam Malik, and 
Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad radiallahu anhuma ajma'een. These are the four dominant a'imma that the entirety of the ummah agreed upon. And so what you have today as an inheritance is you have the school of Imam Abu Hanifa who was born in the 80th year of the Hijrah. You have the school of Imam Malik who was born in the 96th year of the Hijrah. You have the school of Imam al-Shafi'i. You have the school of Imam Ahmad. They are not just single individuals. No, no, no. These are entire schools. Each one of these schools has thousands of scholars, thousands upon thousands of scholars. And this is by the will and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the a'imma, that the ummah, sorry, the ummah gathered around these four people. It is from the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you have, for example, the subcontinent. You look at Pakistan, you look at India, you look at Turkey. There is a certain madhab, a certain path that those people follow in Islamic law. That is the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, the Hanafi school. You look at North Africa, from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, parts of Egypt, parts of the Arabian Peninsula, you will find that they follow who? Imam Malik and the school of Imam Malik. When you think of the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i, you will find that in many parts of the Arabian Peninsula, you look at Yemen, you look at certain parts of India, you look at many parts of the world, Egypt, you will find that the dominant opinion is the school of Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam Ahmad's school, you will find that it exists in many parts of the Arabian Peninsula. And the list goes on. The point that I'm illustrating, brothers and sisters, is very simple. These schools, they did not develop in a vacuum. These schools that many people today find themselves bypassing, many people today find themselves stepping over, neglecting, or even rendering them null and void, saying, Hum rijal, these were just men, wa nahnu rijal. Those were men and we are men. No. No, that's not the way of Islamic intellectual legal heritage. When you have an inheritance, you remember, you recall a couple weeks back, we spoke about the concept of sanad, the unbroken chain of transmission. That unbroken chain of transmission is essential for us to preserve because that's how we receive everything from the Prophet Sallallahu until today. So when the Ummah of Muhammad, what is known as as sawadul al-A'zam, when the vast blackness, the vast majority of the Ummah followed these four madhahib in Islamic law, then today as Muslims who are living in the 21st century, who are trying to navigate the modern world, we do that within the purview of these four madhahib. Because people, when they hear this, they say, oh, you just want us to live in the 7th century or the 14th century. Or what? No, 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 no. These madhahib are schools. They have usul, they have methodologies, they have philosophies, they are rich and they are vibrant. And they are able to come into any time and place and figure out how to negotiate the new questions and the new affairs of that time. If this is what has worked for 1400 years, who are we to say, put this all aside, I am going to follow only the Quran and Sunnah. On what authority are we doing that? On what grounding am I able to do that? And who did these madhahib follow? When Imam Malik, was the founder of his school and Imam Shafi'i and all these schools developed. Aren't they all following the Quran and Sunnah as well? Are they following some other scripture? <laughs> no, they're following the Quran and Sunnah and they had the best possible mastery of the, the, the language and the sciences required to even begin to understand what the Quran and Sunnah is telling us. And so the net result of this brothers and sisters is very simple. Make sure that when you're figuring out what it is you're supposed to be doing, you're doing it within the lineage and the purview of this heritage and not outside of it. Because as I said, today, when it comes to what I should do and what I shouldn't do, we are quickly dismissing this 1400 years of history, this 1400 years of distinct methodology. Many of us, like I said, we will go to the university, we will see a professor who has certain credentials and certain accolades and we'll say, this person is the one that I will follow in telling me what is haram and halal. And they may not even speak Arabic. I have seen legal opinions and the way in which these legal opinions were produced by people who are not specialists in fiqh. They will say, I read 16 dictionaries that analyze this word in the Quran. And I conclude that the meaning of this word in modern day should be this. 
because of one, two, three reasons. What if each and every single one of us did that with the Qur'an? We just started picking up dictionaries and deciding that we are going to figure out what this word means or doesn't mean. That's chaos. That's why when you look at all of these madhahib, these schools of legal thought, you will find that they followed very particular methodologies. They differed on certain points, but in large part, they followed the Qur'an. They followed the sunnah. They have a principle known as al-ijma, scholarly consensus, which is the collective of all of the scholars of our ummah have embraced and endorsed the concept of al-ijma. That this notion that independent scholars who live in independent regions, you have a mujtahid that lives in Iraq, a mujtahid that lives in the subcontinent, a mujtahid that lives in Australia, each of them processing the Quran and Sunnah arrive at opinions independent of one another. Because sometimes people think ijma is like a council. You know, in certain other faith traditions, there was the council of Nicaea, the council of X, to arrive at certain theological opinions or legal opinions. Ijma is not a council. Ijma is independent scholars arriving at independent conclusions. And then when, they were, when those opinions were assessed, they were found to be all the same opinion. And that is scholarly consensus that is binding. That is a binding consensus. You see that the scholars use the, the principle of qiyas, analogical reasoning to deal with new developments. You would find them taking new circumstances, new ahkam, and trying to analogically reason them with ahkam that already exists in the Quran and Sunnah or through ijma. And the list goes on. So what you will find is that, is that there is a methodology. So my brothers and sisters, my sincere care for myself and for all of you and for this ummah, in هَذَا الْعِلْمَ دِينَ فَانْظُرُوا عَمَّنْ تَأْخُذُونَ دِينَكُمْ as our pious predecessor has said, that this ilm that we're talking about, this knowledge is a matter of deen. Be very selective about who you take your, de your deen from. Make sure, as I've said many times, that the person that you are choosing to take your deen from, the deen that you will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with on the day of judgment, that that person was a credentialed person who arrived at valid opinions through the embodiment and the following of 1400 years of tradition, not modern developments, not modern opinions, not modern approaches that are devoid of this history. This deen of ours, this rich tradition, it very much has the ability through the purview of these four madhahib, these four schools of legal thought to engage every single complexity of our time. Because I know many people say, well, what do you do with cryptocurrency? You know, what do you do with, with stem cell research? What do you do with genome technologies and all of what's happening in the medical and the financial space? That too, all of it, can be managed, understood, and processed through the purview of our schools that span for 1400 years. Yes, today we may not have individual mujtahideen, people who are of the standing of Imam al-Shafi'i and others. Yeah, we don't have those people today. Is that door open? It's potentially open, very hard to accomplish. However, however, in its place we have majami'a, fiqhiyya. We have groupings of scholars that come together from all of these schools of legal thought, the Ahnaf and the Shafi'i and the Maliki and so on, coming together to analyze and process the current challenges of our day within the lineage of these 1400 years to try to move forward in a way that is most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In closing, before we get to the next khutbah, some of you may say, listen, sheikh, imam, whatever, all you're saying is, sounds very nice. I have no idea what Shafi'i, Maliki, Ahmad, all these, I don't know any of that. I just want to be a good Muslim. What's my role? What, what do I do? It's very simple. If you're not someone who is a bit more advanced and someone who is uh, familiar with these names, and you're someone who's just your average Muslim, then you find a credible scholar in your community, in your area, around you, wherever, it doesn't matter, that has credentials, that has peer review and recognition, and you say, okay, after I did some of my own level of analysis, I will follow this person because I trust that they have the necessary credentials to give me opinions about the deen of Allah. And that's all you have to do. And then on the day of judgment, when, you, when Allah asks you, why did you do that? You say, that person right there. That person right there. 
They told me to do this. Then you relieve yourself of blame. However, however, brothers and sisters, you can't say to Allah Yawm Al-Qiyamah, oh, the reason I did this is because my cousin told me it was okay. That doesn't work. You can't say Yawm Al-Qiyamah, oh, I did this because my professor in the university said that this is what should be. And they weren't even Muslim. You can't say that to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. The amana, the trust that I have to convey to you is that there is religious scholarship, there is a heritage, there is a methodology, there is an approach, there is a science to this deen. And we cannot just simply bypass it on our own whims and desires. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us fiqh fi deenihi. Allahumma fiqhna fi deenik. Oh Allah grant us knowledge and grant us wisdom in your deen. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما Brothers and sisters in closing we mentioned that every khutbah until Ramadan comes and Ramadan is just over two weeks away May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in our month of Sha'ban and may he balighna Ramadan. Allahumma barik lana fi Sha'ban wa balighna Ramadan. May Allah bless us in this month of Sha'ban and allow us to be blessed and honored to be amongst those who will worship you in the month of Ramadan. Allahumma ameen. We want to, we mentioned that we will give every week some reminders to prepare ourselves for the month of Ramadan. Today, I want to remind my brothers and sisters about communal harmony. That when we look at Ramadan as a month, as a virtuous month. One of the essential qualities of the month of Ramadan is that it is a time for communal harmony, for togetherness. SubhanAllah, it is a time, month of Ramadan is a time of the year where we gather together to eat in a way that never happens in the remainder of the year. We will find ourselves regularly having iftar together in the community here in the masjid or in our homes. It is a time of the year when we come together and we pray in a way that we do, we don't do outside of the month of Ramadan. So, so many of us every night, mashallah, will come together and pray Qiyamul Layl. May Allah give us the strength and the ability and the desire to pray every single night Qiyamul Layl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it that there is the greatest gathering point of all of the believers on the day of Eid that is at the end of the month of Ramadan. So you see that there is a idea here, there's a thread. Be together, love one another, care for each other, serve one another. And so the first advice that I have in this regard, brothers and sisters, make it that this month of Ramadan, you will be at the helm, at the head of making sure that the community is together, that brothers and sisters love one another, care for one another, and that no one is left out of this community. Brothers and sisters, the quality about Boston is that there are many people who are by themselves. Many people here who are students, many people here who are for medical treatment, people who are here for postdocs and whatever it is, who are here for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. And very often, many of us in this masjid right now will find ourselves alone in the month of Ramadan, that we won't be invited to anyone's home. And that is a very painful experience for any of us who've experienced the pain of wahda, the pain of wahda, the pain of being alone. So last Ramadan, we had a project known as Project Ansar, where we ensured that all of the people who are by themselves find a place to have iftar. So make it an individual obligation on each of you to say this month of Ramadan, I won't just invite my friends and family, but I will invite into my home as many people as I can that I would have never considered to invite into my home. Make sure that you invite people who are very different from you, who come from very different backgrounds, very different experiences, economically, socially, culturally, it doesn't matter. Bring people into your home. Show Allah Jalla wa ala that you care deeply about the followers of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. Let your home be a, a, a refuge for those who are alone. Just like the Prophet ﷺ did with the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Many of us here were Ansar, many of us are Muhajireen. 
and we need our uh, many uh, those of us who are muhajireen we need our ansar and those of us who are ansar we need our muhajireen so that's number one invite people into your home make sure that your home is a place of warmth and comfort number two in the spirit of communal harmony the the, the ideal of forgiving from the essential essential qualities of the month of Ramadan and the life of the believer is the spirit of forgiveness. We have to learn to forgive one another. The Prophet Sallallahu tells us that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Ar-Rahimuna Yarhamuhum Ar-Rahman Irhamu Man Fil Ard Yarhamkum Man Fil Sama Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has mercy upon those who have mercy with one another. Have mercy with your brothers and sisters. And from the ways in which that you ensure Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala forgiving you is by forgiving others. I know many of us, we have plenty, plenty, plenty of baggage, relationships with friends, with family, with other people that have gone south, that we carry in our heart hatred, right? We have this hatred for certain people and anger at certain people for whatever reason, because of something that happened or something that was done or did. Learn, learn, learn to forgive. Forgive so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. You may have uh, something that happened 20 years ago with one of your relatives and she wasn't nice to you or he wasn't nice to you or didn't do this or didn't say salam or didn't invite you somewhere. And until today, you're so angry and just forgive, forgive. But with that said, every single time I say this on the mimbar, at least 10 people after the khutbah will come and say, Sheikh, forgiveness is one thing. But how about someone that has taken from me something? Someone who's stolen from me $250,000. Someone once told me this in one community. It says someone, this person, who's my brother, stole from me $250,000. How can I forgive that person? Here is the distinction. Here is the distinction. There's a difference between forgiving, where you forgive someone. That's a spiritual state in the heart. That's a spiritual thing in the heart where I go to sleep. Maghfirah, al-afu, I forgive in my heart. There's another thing that is called raddul huquq, the return of rights. Because forgiving doesn't always mean that you forget, not necessarily. It could mean that, for example, let's say I stole from you $100. May Allah forgive us. And then you say, you know what? I forgive you and I forgive the $100. Right? That is, a, that is a forgiveness of the spiritual heart and the forgiveness of what? The haqq, the right that is to be fulfilled. Now, for example, if I, if I may forgive you, but there's still $250,000 that I need for my family and my business that has to be returned. Those are two different things. So I want us to make this distinction because many of us don't make that distinction. Forgiveness is when you empty your heart of hatred or, or you know, al-hiqd, wal-hasad, wal-bughd, and all so on and so forth. Forgetting is a whole other thing. You know, there, there, there are clear, there's clear zulm. There's clear evil that may exist. There are some, there's something called haqqullah, the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I may forgive you, but I cannot forgive you the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't just say, oh, I forgive you, and I forgive Allah's rights. <laughs> That's not my, I don't own Allah's rights. Allah has a hurma. Allah has a right that has to be fulfilled. He has shara'ya, he has commands that he's placed in the Qur'an and Sunnah. That he says, when this mistake happens, this is how you punish it. This is how you deal with it. So I can forgive you on a personal level, but I cannot forgive the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you see, there's a distinction between forgiving and forgetting. There's also, let's say I make a mistake. And my father, my father says, I love you, but the consequence of your mistake is this. That's not a question of forgiveness. That's a question of, I made a mistake, there's a consequence to my mistake. Those are diff very different. So, so sometimes we make mistakes, we suffer the consequences, and then we think it's a matter of forgiveness and not forgiveness. No. Very, the Prophet Wasallam did not he many times find himself in a situation where the companions had to deal with the consequences of their actions, and he did it only with love? So that's another thing. So brothers and sisters, make sure that you figure out what your situation is. Because sometimes someone will say, you know what? I forgive, but I will not forget because this person once, they said something I didn't like. And until this person is belittled and harmed, I will not forget. No, that's not a haq. <laughs> that's not haq mu'tabar. That's not a right that is recognizable in Allah. 
So brothers and sisters, make sure that if you have wronged anyone, if you have wronged anyone, that you seek their forgiveness before Ramadan to ensure that the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend upon you. Don't allow your wrongs that you have not sought forgiveness to be an impediment and a barrier from your ability to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I am someone who's, there are, there, there are times, brothers and sisters, and may Allah forgive us, where people have spread rumors about someone being a zani, that someone was a fornicator, or someone was a thief, and I spread these rumors, may Allah forgive us. If I am someone who spread these rumors, I have to ask that person for forgiveness and I have to make sure that the people that I have told that this person was a zani or this person is a thief or a cheat, that I have to go and I have to fix that. Because that is a haq that has to be replaced. Brothers and sisters, you understand this? This is a very subtle point, may Allah forgive us. And lastly, inshallah, before we close, the spirit of communal harmony doesn't just expand, extend to the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The spirit of communal harmony extends to all of Allah jalla wa ala's creation. The Prophet sallallahu was sent, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We sent you, ya Muhammad, as a mercy to mankind, to all of the worlds. The spirit of Muslims in this world is very simple. We have love and mercy and compassion for all people regardless of whether we agree or disagree with them on any level. Wallahi, we have mercy and love. Doesn't mean that we don't have adl and ihsan, we don't have justice and excellence, but we have rahmah. The disposition of the believer is not to combat. The disposition of the believer is to be merciful. So we have mercy and love and compassion for our Christian brothers. We have mercy and compassion for our Jewish brothers. We have mercy even with the atheists. We have mercy for those who reject Allah. There is mercy there. There is compassion. There is a desire to see guidance and happiness. Even for people who live other types of lifestyles and dispositions that we may categorically disagree with, but we still have mercy. We still have compassion and we still desire people to be in the best of states. And we should never stereotype people. We should never say, oh, the Jews are this or the, the Christians are that or the atheists are this. We are not a people who stereotype. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be muhsineen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our sins and our shortcomings. May Allah unify our hearts and minds. May He bring our hearts and minds together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make strong this community, put harmony in this community, put love and compassion and care and togetherness. May we always extend the olive branch and the hand of salam to one another. May Allah forgive us and guide us and help us. In Allah, he amuru bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha an al fahshai wal munkari wal baghi. Ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon wa nadhikru Allahi akbar wa Allahu ya'lamu ma tasna'un.